before starting Pacific Avenue, like what's the background? Where are you yeah. from and how'd you get here? Yeah, so I, I grew up in, in the Midwest. I went to Indiana University where I was an accounting finance major um, and always had a slant towards wanting to fix things. Uh, and, and so that, that naturally led me into restructuring and turnaround. And so my first first job out of school was at Arthur Anderson in the restructuring group. That migrated into, a, into another consulting firm doing turnaround and restructuring. Yeah. Went to business school, went to Bain and Company. How did you know that you had that mentality of wanting to fix things? Yeah. I, I love, you know, I like problems and I, and I don't want to be in a steady state. And so when there's a challenge, there's a sense of urgency that comes along with a, a restructuring. And that's where I strive, is where there's decisions have to be made quick. You have incomplete information and you have to do the best you can with that. And so what I learned early on in my career is, is if you're decisive and you can take limited data and quickly make decisions, you can get results. And the other side of turnarounds is, is when you're successful. It's pretty exciting because the, the transformation of where you started to where you end uh, is very impactful. What did you do at Bain? How long sure. were you there? What were you doing? So I was at Bain uh, five and a half years and un unbelievable training ground in terms of ability to communicate, translate uh, heavy analytics into PowerPoint and then verbal communication to drive change. The, the challenge for me at Bain was you're an advisor, you're a consultant, you're not a, you're not a doer. I think where Bain is excellent is, is they excel at practical outcomes and results and ensuring and helping push that through. The challenge is, is you're not the one doing it. And so your, your job is to, to drive through facts and through motivation, but ultimately you're not a decision maker. And that, that to me was unsatisfying, yeah. very unsatisfying. We were fortunate, we, we built a turnaround and restructuring practice. I got to be part of that uh, where we went into companies as first time I got to really be an executive and be interim management and run businesses and make decisions. And that was invigorating. And at that point is when I realized I wanted to do it in a different way, and private equity was 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 that path to do yeah. it in a different way. Um, so, what was after Bain? So then, Gore's the Gore's group. Uh, we're Gore again. I, I feel like I've had unbelievable mentors. Uh, Alec uh, is a he's a he's a visionary. He, he started a type of investing that's turned into something very different today, and was at the forefront of private equity. I can remember sitting in his office at times and him saying to the group we need to get back to doing deals like we used to do and and the team resisted it everybody was ready to do typical private equity deals yeah. and Alex's view was no we shouldn't do anything typical that's not what got us here and that's part of why the firm you know he went a different path at the end and wanted to wanted to get away from it because he didn't like that typical model what I've never actually learned the gore story sure you know this this area in Los Angeles with Platinum, Gores, Marlins. There's They're probably like, 25 spinouts now. And spinouts of spinouts of spinouts. But what's like, I mean, it's, it seems like all roads lead back to yep. a few. Yep. Like, what is the Gore story? Like, where's Alec from? Alec like, grew up in Michigan. He... Actually, same, not, not dissimilar to where I grew up. Uh, his family was, uh, his father owned a grocery store. And he he is, he's a visionary in that he saw an opportunity to solve needs for businesses, which is what we're trying to do at Pacific. There are, there, are, there are certain businesses in private equity, typically they want to buy a good business, improve it, and sell it for more. Alex's view was, I want to buy something that someone doesn't want and find value in it and then and then create value How for did myself. he start it? It's from Michigan. Wasn't he there a time when the family he started moved to like Lebanon or? Well, he's a Lebanese descent. But wasn't there a time when they moved? I don't, I can't say I know okay. his whole history in that regard. He started it because he had a computer company uh, and he was selling computers out of his, I believe, out of the trunk of his car. Yeah. And he got uh, he, he got people to believe in him. A large company bought that from him for, I, I want to say it was a million dollars, which yeah. was a huge sum for right. him and his family back then. And he realized, wow, this is, this is interesting. There's a lot of data that I got from these computers. And a couple years later, that company called him back and wanted him to buy it back. And so he realized companies were divesting assets. And that they did, and he was like, "Great!" I think he bought it back I mean, for a dollar. He didn't have like a finance background, and it was no, just... I, not that I'm aware of, no formal education. Yeah. He went to Central Michigan, um, and neat guy, and still is involved in that university. Uh, but he he never wanted to settle for the status quo. He is not. He's 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 obviously a visionary. But some of the some of the things that I've learned from him, took from him is the idea that don't do what everybody else is doing, and and 
we don't, we're not, he put his firm in LA for a reason. He didn't put his firm in New York. When he put his firm out here, there was no private equity universe in Los Angeles. It was well, all when did the Gores Group like really, so he this, was, when did this area, like, when did the LA private equity kind of really start getting off the ground? Alex started in the early 90s and, okay. and was very, very successful. He made billions, whatever the yeah. number is, pre-fund. Then he raised the fund, I believe, in 2001 and successively went from there uh, into three funds. But his passion was always pre-funds. And that's if you look at Tom Gores, who obviously spun out of, plat out of Gores to form Platinum. Tom spent five or six years pre-fund before he invested. Um, and then you've got you know, Dave McGovern out of Marlin. And then there's, again, I can name 15 spin-outs now. When you say visionary, like why was Alec a visionary? When I interact with him, Alec never looked at a problem the same way everybody else looked at it. Alec was never constrained by spreadsheets and, and management team. Alec, Alec, Alec at his core is a poker player, and so he's a great deal guy, which means he can read a situation and without having to see numbers on a page can tell you if it's a good deal because he can read the other guy. And that's, that's, that's different than, than a lot of the other firms where it's very analytically driven. But how do you make sure that what you know Alec had and being a visionary that intuition yeah. making sure that the team is developed around you yeah well I think one of my observations of, of funds and, and Gores to some extent is when you hire from outside with different DNA that that starts to transform your firm and so what we're doing at Pacific is, is we're building our team and it is it's you know the diversest guys who are spin out from Gores they spent uh, six or seven years getting to the point. I think they just closed on 250 million. Yeah, so really neat, dynamic guys. And they're, they're, you know, I saw a video that they posted about brick by brick. That, that's yeah. I, did you guys have something to do with that? Yes, we did. Okay. Well, <laughs> that, that resonates in a way to me. I mean, when I heard them say that, it was like that's right because it's not. You can't. You can't just bring people in to do this. And we're fortunate. We brought a senior person in Jason who who came from Platinum, was in the small cap fund, was with Tom Gore's pre-fund, so he knows really the model. The DNA and I had the fortune of having a relationship with him before he lives in the neighborhood, but our other guys, we have to build them up over time. And so we've got Mike, who's been with me almost from day one, within the first three or four months, Sun Capital, uh, similar background, but he's we've done 11 transactions in 25 months, 26 months. So we've been very busy. He sees exactly how we think, how we do them. Obviously, he's adding his piece to it. And then our, our associates, we promoted a guy uh, this week, Johnny. I saw this morning. Yeah, the vice president. Johnny to VP, and then you yep. also brought in a head of business development. Yeah. Um, but it is about building them so they see how we do deals. Our deals are not the, not the standard. We're not getting a book from a bold bracket investment bank that a private equity funds own the company and and you're saying I'm going to pay eight times, nine times, eleven times for this. Our deals have hair on them. They have they, there's something that isn't right that someone's trying to, to not necessarily run away from a problem, but they're mm -hmm. trying to they're trying to divest of something. What are the different triggers that you go through when someone says there's hair on this deal? That's I guess the is that AKA it requires more thinking than other people are willing to do? Yes, some fo so it's a risk tolerance, in my view. Some folks, it's if you're, if you're, a, you're in a large fund and you're, you have to present to an investment committee and something you don't know a lot about, you may be uncomfortable. You may be uncomfortable bringing something forward in deals where there's things that are, aka hairier, there's more risk for things to go wrong. And if you're trying to be steady down the fairway to get promoted to the next level to make partner, you're not incentivized to take risks. You're, you're just not. Your goal is to make, call it somewhere between a 2x and a 3x or whatever return your fund size that you need to allocate and write towards. That That's not our goal. We're, willing, we're, we're, we're assessing risk and taking the reward commensurate with it, and some don't work out. How do you quickly make decisions and assess whether or not this type of deal is for you? Yeah, yeah. So it's experience, it's experience, but it's, it's, is the seller the right seller? Are they motivated? Does the company have a secret competitive sauce that we can exploit? Is it, it doesn't have to be something remarkable. It doesn't have to be Apple, but it has to be something that we can exploit and build on. And then finally, is there value if we do that? And can we add value beyond exploiting that to take a business to the next level? You take all of those back and you say, okay, now, is someone else willing to put the work in to do this and take the risk? 
and 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 understand the odds of the of the transaction can you get it done so when you're a small firm I think we're up to eight folks now but when you're a small firm you have to pick your bets and, and I think one of the things we've been really successful is we picked our bets well we don't waste time on things our broken deal fees across <clears throat> across 11 transactions are very very low very very low because we are focused on getting deals done when we sign an LOI we're 11 for 12 when we sign an LOI and getting it done uh, because it, and the one is it's still outstanding it's gone 12 months I think we will get it done here in the next 60 days we, we commit to it we're, 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 we keep integrity around tra transacting but we, we're gonna pick our right situations and we're not gonna spend time on stuff that we can't win we don't have the we don't have the luxury of doing it. so what scares me about getting bigger people want to do things and keep busy I don't want to do things to keep busy. I want to do things and create value. And so I'd rather my team go home at 2 o'clock than spend time on something that isn't productive because it's a bad, it's a bad habit and it's about creating good habits. What do you think is one personal habit that you have that has made you effective? And what do you think is one firm habit yep. as part of the culture? Um, so, we, so I'll talk about the firm first. I, I think within the first year, I was getting caught up on things, whether it was personnel with our portfolio companies and, and busy and obviously impact on family life, impact on personal life, and made a decision that we are only going to spend time on things that create value. Our job is to create value. Obviously, we want to do that in a way that's respectful to the team, to respectful to our, to our, to our partners, but it is about creating value. And so if it does not create value, why are we spending time on it? And that is, that is culturally, I, I consistently challenge our team, why are we doing that? Why, why are we spending time on it? Is it creating value for ourselves and our shareholder or our investors? If it's not, stop doing it. We don't have to do what every other firm does. We're not trying to be every other firm. Do you so say that to your four it. kids like, that's not creating value, no <laughs> bueno. <laughs> well, I, my goal with them is for them to be competitive, one, to be compassionate, two, and then yeah, focus on things that are, that are, that are, that, that drive results. What do you, what do you think you're, like the family values are. And I'm asking this because I'm also going through yeah. this. My wife and I are thinking like, wait a second, there are no guiding principles, guiding sure. values that we've like well, clearly look, thought about. Look, we're, we're faith-centered um, in our family and that's, that's, that's guiding. Uh, we're, we're, for us, our family is, is a critical um, piece. So we're, we like to be together. We like to do things together. Um, and then we, we, my wife is, a, is, a, is a, an unbelievable woman, but her belief and our belief is if you do something, do it well. If you, look, our kids are young. If they don't want to play a sport, yeah. don't play it. And they're very active, but if they're going to do it, go out there and do your best. It's not okay to not do your best. That, that is not something we can tolerate. And it's, you don't have to be the best at it. You just have to do your best and do it with compassion. Is there a time when you, those principles that you have brought into the, into the office or into when you're interacting with founders, like an example of compassion? Look, it's an evolution uh, for for us as a firm and, and as an individual to try and be more compassionate. I'm, I'm an analytical guy, and so that doesn't come naturally, and I have the, the benefit of my wife who, who is analytical and compassionate. She has the EQ and the IQ. Uh, I think I was born with neither, but been able to kind of patch it together. Um, but for for us, our teams at our companies, they're our partners. I, I can go in and, at, at Cameron Ashley, which is a 700, 680 person firm. I will venture to say I know 500 people on that team. And I, I, they're, they're all important. And we have a history of, of having at times to change out management, but there's a respectful way to do it. And there are people involved on the other side. And so for us, it's, it's just an evolution about treating people the right way. It doesn't Again, we, we don't want someone in the wrong role. If you're not successful, we're gonna move you out. But we, 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 there is a personal side to it. What was it like starting the firm? Alec Gore's group was going through a transition. I had a neat opportunity to stay. We were not aligned around the economics, which, which uh, he's probably right, but so he said, I'm gonna prove it to myself. And I was fortunate enough to have a, a spouse who was like, go for it, chase your dream, and we'll make it work. Do you, was there a particular conversation where that happened? You yeah. know, I was, it was July 17th, well, 3 p.m. No, it took, it, it, I don't think you just, that's not a decision you make rash, especially when you have four kids, yeah. um, because you, it impacts a lot of people. What, what we came to, and I, uh, folks, I, I would say uh, several times a month, people call me and say, what are you, what are you, uh, how did you decide to do this? What are you thinking? And my first question to them every time is, is what does your spouse say? Because you can't, you, you, 
you can't get through this without your spouse because it is it's it's hard right you're you're failing most days and it's hard so if you have support and they're bought in you can get through it and you will but if you don't and not not having them support you is a challenge why do you feel that you felt like you were failing most days because the perception of like go off well this job not you don't you in buying companies and fixing them you were successful in one in a hundred that you buy that you can get done and then when you buy it boy then you say what did I just do um, and now I've got to go fix it um, and so and this is the other the second thing I went once people have started the second thing I say is are there days you just don't want to answer your phone and everyone says yes and then I said, the good news is is if your phone stops ringing then you have a problem because you either don't have anything going on or people are lying to you um, and if you don't have anything going on then you don't have business and if people are lying to you you're gonna lose your business so <laughs> you want people to call you with your problems that's why you're here that's why you want to be the boss so you can take deal deal with the problems that's why you, that's why we have a team so we can deal with the problems so there was a period of time where it's 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 just hard because you're always having to deal with something that didn't work and so now today you're used to things not working and you just put your head down and you fix it and you move on to the next one my, my phone will ring all day long and through the night and people know i get up early so it starts about 5 30 um and i know it's going to be a busy day when my phone starts ringing before 5 30 and it's it's because there's an issue that we have to work through what's your morning routine because i one of the things in being exposed to a lot of tim ferris yep. content one of the consistent threads throughout everyone is they have a morning routine yeah which I don't, so I'm trying to explore this. <laughs> yeah. No, well, you have young kids, so it's different with young kids. Your morning routine is just to survive. Um, it, it, it's evolved. I like to be up early. I like to be up between 5 and 5.30. Uh, I spend about 10 minutes thinking about what I need to get done for the day. So I read something, tackling your biggest issues first, and I, I try and do that. So what are the challenges I have to face that day, and how am I going to get to them as soon as I can? So I spend about 10 minutes doing that. Then I'll, I'll either catch up on emails or, or read the news for about another 15 minutes. By 5.30, 5.45, I, I work out. Um, I try and be home by 7, which is when my children are getting up. Spend an hour with them, uh, take them to school at uh, 8.10, and then head to the office. So, and, then it, your, and then from there it goes any number of directions. What does the next phase for you look like? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, so we're done with startup phase. <laughs> we're, I think we're, yeah. You know, I always joke, when you start, you're, you're just trying to figure out what you're going to do the next hour. And then about six months in, it was like, okay, I can plan for the week a little bit. What am I going to do this week? Then it was, okay, now I'm three months in. I, I can look quarter by quarter. My goal is, is I know, you know tactically what I have to get done. I can't create a strategy. You have people on your team that you know aren't right, but it's all you can afford, or you're not even paying them and they're just helping you. So you're in a, you're in a weird spot where all you're trying to do is get enough critical mass and things done to get there. Then... I would say a year and a year and a half ago, okay, let's take a breath. What are we thinking we want to be when we grow up? And grow up meaning six months from now, a year from now. And so we're in that phase. We just finished our year-end goal session, which we do as a team, and then we have each of our portfolio companies do. Um, what do we want to be? We want to be a differentiated investment firm that maximizes returns. We want to be focused on creating value. I want to create value for myself, my family, and my team. That, that's what we want to do. What form that takes, I don't know that we have an answer yet. Will we raise a fund? Maybe, ultimately. We have no challenge to access to capital at all. Um, we've been fortunate we have our own capital base. Um, and if we need outside capital, it's there because of the returns we've generated. So we're, we're there as, you know, you, were, you and I started talking, there's 6,000 firms in private equity today. There's over $750 billion of dry powder. Do, I want to make sure if we raise capital and when we raise capital, we have the team to put it to work effectively. Our model is not, again, getting a bunch of books that are well-run businesses and bidding them and paying the most. And so if we don't train people how to do that, then we're going we're gonna to make mistakes. And so we have to continue to build our team, as Ron and Kevin said at the Versus, brick by brick so that we can put capital to work effectively. And, and, and we're, we've gone through our growing pains, and part of what's been great about adding to our team is we're putting some of the processes in place so that we can scale. And so that's what that's what we continue to work on. We have the infrastructure, we've got great office, we have the IT, we have the the compliance components all done now. We've got a large enough team. We can we're running you know we can run two and three deals at a time plus plus add-ons and, and work with our portfolio. 
so we're building all of those muscles, but we're not we're not in a rush because rush to take capital so I can rush to put it to work so I can then rush to raise a bigger fund. I'm not convinced that drives the most economic return. So this makes me think of a number of things. One is how much happier do you think you would be, your team would be, investors would be in a fund structure? Are you, what are you actually optimizing yeah. for in terms of lifestyle? And then the second question is, is your current structure actually what is best for this next economic cycle? Yeah, so the first point is, look, our team wants to be challenged, as do I. We want to be successful and we want to make money. And, and whatever structure we can do that in is best. Look, if you look at private equity, there's an evolution going on around long dated funds. And that, that resonates with me. Folks, historically, you sell your best assets because you can take a mark, which means you can raise more money, and you hold on to your worst assets. And, and then you raise more money so you can go try and find a good asset to buy. That, that's, that feels counterintuitive to me. What feels right to me is, is you find a good asset, you invest behind that asset, which is what we're doing. We're, we're doing add-ons, we're doing green fields, uh, we're focusing on organic growth. And I would rather put 50 or 60% of our capital behind something that we know and understand. So think of this as you're a blackjack player, which I'm not a big gambler. You're at the table, you're showing 11, the dealer's showing six. You want to double down. You want to put more money around something you know. And, and that's what we're trying to do as investors. And then we want to hold that and keep it rolling and, and keep, look, at the end of the day, there's, there's, there's return on multiple uh, MOIC and there's IRR. It's all about yield. People are chasing yield and, and private equities turned into terminal value and, and exits to create that yield. There can be great yield from good portfolio companies as well. And that yield can be more consistent and longer term. So we don't, Back to the, the blackjack example, we want to place bets where we know. And every time you do a new deal, it's a bet. It's a new set of cards. You can do as much diligence as you want. You're going to be wrong sometimes. But if you own a business, you have a team, you understand the ecosystem around it, you can then say, geez, I'm not comfortable. I'm not going to bet more here. Or I am comfortable and I'm going to put more capital down. And that's our, that's our model and that's our belief. And that tends to be more long dated. So, look, I don't have illusions that a first-time fund um, is going to be able to go raise long-dated capital, so we're going to do it a different way. Um, and when we have the track record and we prove it and we're ready, we'll, we'll find the right structure. The beauty is, is with the independent sponsor model, the long-dated fund, the, the, the individuals who are willing and the, the, the capital bases that are willing to back individuals just with the pool of capital. There's plenty of flexibility beyond this two and 20 private equity model that I think creates some perversion in incentives. Let's do the story about why you started again. I didn't ever want to look back and, and be able to say to them, I didn't go for it. I could say to them, I didn't, I didn't pull it off. I could go get a job somewhere making a decent living and it would be, it would be fine. And my wife and I were okay if that was the outcome. So that was a motivation. And then it's fun to be the boss, right? I mean, I, I don't, I don't want. There's responsibility with it, but it, it's fun. I, I like being the boss. I like being able to to, yeah, to make decisions and use my experiences uh, and and team's input to make decisions. It, some people view it as a burden to have the consequences of the decision. I view it as it, it's exciting. It's invigorating. Yeah, it, on that point, um, I think one of my key motivators for entrepreneurship actually comes through freedom. Yep. The freedom to create in the directions that you want. Yep. The freedom to test things when and where and how you want. Yep. Um, and it's there are definite downsides because sometimes you can't have the you know the resources to try bigger things or it takes so much longer to get there. Well, and you, I mean how do you make the trade off of investing to grow but trying to be comfortable and that's as an entrepreneur we struggle with it every day. I'm sure you guys do as well. I struggle with a lot every day. <laughs> well, yeah. That's, you're at the beginning stages. Here's the list. I got a lot more right here. <laughs> that's right. But um, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Right? I mean, that's what we always say. If it was easy, then everybody would do it. And it's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. It wouldn't be fun if it was easy. It's like giving someone something. If you give them something, they don't respect it. They don't value it. It's, it's part of the problem with our society. Today. People want you to give them something. Once you get something, someone gives it to you. You don't earn it. You don't care. But if you earn it and you work for it, then you care and you and you think differently about it. And that's the that's the fun thing about being an entrepreneur. And that's what our team collectively, I know it's me here, but our team has done. We've all we've all earned it and wanted it. We've been through the trials. And so it means more to us. What does your wife mean to you? Well, 
I mean, she she's she's the basis of our family. Together we are. So she she's she's she is she's she. I mean, she means everything. How how long is how long have you been married? 12, 13 years. I think we were going through the math. We've been dating for fifteen or seventeen years. So a while. How we met you, in college, and it's it's a, it's a blessing. How do you keep things together? <laughs> With you know, that's one of the things I've been kind of working through now is. You know, the first two years of startup life, I was just gone. Yeah, yeah, and, you are. And it, and and then and this year, you know, coming out on year four, it, it's trying to figure out how do we do more, how are we more integrated? Yep. So it's not that. So we feel like we're in doing this together. Yep. Not yeah. just divide and conquer. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that we. I can give you any giant words of wisdom here. I think it's a work in progress. The thing that I think we continue to strive for is how to. How do you integrate? Because to your point, you can it can be very tactical, and you can be focused on your profession. She can be focused on her profession, and we can be focused on the kids. Um, but how do we integrate? And I think that's that's through through church, that's through our family, that's through our community, that's through charity. Those are the things that we have to find to bring together. And we're it's a work in progress. Yeah, it is an absolute work in progress. Um, but it's also part of the journey and part part of the fun uh, is is working through that together. The work in process idea is interesting because so much of how I think we feel is that we want a final product, yeah. and then whether it's re relationships, our team, or with business, it's it's I think an acceptance that life is a work in progress. Yeah, it it never stops. That that that's that's true with the firm. That's true with your family. That's true with your wife. Um, it it never stops. And I think being I one thing I'm. Fortunate, and I, I think it, it has its. There certainly everything has a negative side. Is I'm okay with discomfort, and I'm okay with conflict, and so. But out of each of those comes growth. Some people are less comfortable with uncertainty and discomfort. For me, it, it, I'm able to. I'm able to put it away and focus on the next thing and come back to it. And, and I think that's that's been a big, a big positive for me. But uh, yeah, it's you know, it, it's never it's never done.